motion from the Committee for Health. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly approves the report of the Committee for Health on its inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 in care homes, NIA 59 bar 17 to 22, and calls on the Minister of Health to implement the recommendations contained in the report as part of the ongoing response to protect care home residents during future surges of the pandemic. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Health, Colm Gillenry, to move the motion. So moved. Can I call you? Thank you. The Business Committee has allowed two hours for this debate. You will have 15 minutes to propose and 15 minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. Can call you. As of the 1st of January, 775 of our care home residents had died with COVID-19, some 40% of all registered COVID-related deaths. It was clear from the early stages of the pandemic that there would be significant impacts on older people and particularly care home residents. And much of the committee's work in the spring was focused in this area, prompting our decision in July to conduct an inquiry. In setting its objectives, the committee agreed that it wished to be forward-looking, to put its energy into learning from recent experience in order to provide constructive suggestions for the future. Many of the issues from staff, terms and conditions to workforce shortages, funding and regulation brought the wider question of adult social care reform into sharp focus. There was virtual consensus on a number of significant points in relation to pandemic planning from acknowledgement of pre-existing workforce shortages to initial problems with PPE supply and testing capacity. Mr Speaker, you will be glad to hear that I do not intend to go through all 54 recommendations, but I do want to give the House a sense of the areas that we looked at in this report. In terms of visiting, where a speed of response was challenged in terms of government, I do not think anyone said the same of the care homes. Most had restricted visiting or closed the doors before they were actually told to do so. One of the sessions that really hit home for me and I think for other members was an informal Zoom call with families of residents who described the traumatic impact of visiting restrictions on the physical and mental well-being of their loved ones, the vital importance of ensuring meaningful contact and the limits of technology for those with sensory or cognitive impairment. They recognised the sterling work done by staff to provide care in the most difficult circumstances and the risks involved in visiting. But they were very clear that risk had to be managed in communication with families, and the committee recommends that. And, but this, this also must be balanced against the harm caused by isolation as their loved ones approached the end of their lives. Our report endorses their calls for safe and meaningful contact to be facilitated through identification and implementation of innovative measures, for rapid rollout of the Care Partnership Initiative, and for better communication and consistent implementation of guidance. In relation to testing, significant progress has been made since this time last year in terms of testing and is certainly one of the key elements to addressing this and any future pandemic. The committee recommends that subject to rapid testing becoming available, there should be daily testing of all those entering the care home, including residents having attended an external appointment. Capacity issues remain, and the committee recommends further consideration of pooled testing to make better use of existing capacity and an increase in local capacity to test and analyse results. From an early stage, the committee expressed concerns about patients being discharged from hospitals to care homes without a negative test, and this was reinforced by evidence around the challenges of isolating older and vulnerable individuals, particularly those with cognitive decline. The committee recommends that no one be discharged from hospital to a care home in which they are a resident without having tested negative for COVID-19 unless the care home confirms that it has the staffing and facilities to ensure isolation for the required period and that that should be subject to monitoring and review. We continue to believe that step-down isolation facilities should be explored as a way to reduce risk further. Access to PPE then, having heard very worrying evidence of PPE shortages in the spring, aggravated by a global shortage 
on spiralling prices, it came as a great relief to hear by May that supplies to cure homes had stabilised and were being provided free of charge, which we understand remains the case for the moment. There remains a longer term question around procurement, and the Committee recommends that charges should not be imposed on care homes without a review of the tariff. In terms of funding, the pre existing strain on the sector, uh, staff levels, and staff terms and conditions was exacerbated by COVID, which generated additional costs from staffing to cleaning and support for visiting. A number of very welcome additional funding allocations were made available some $6.5 million in April, $11 million in June, and a further $27 million in October, as well as staff support and PPE. Questions remain, however, about underspends arising from administrative constraints, leading to the Committee's recommendation that streamlined processes are required, subject to audit and verification, but flexible enough to allow care homes to meet their particular needs at any given time. We have asked some of our lowest paid workers throughout this pandemic to shoulder an enormous burden on our behalf over the past year. The skill and value of that work is long overdue proper acknowledgement. For many, it is a vocation rather than a job, but we must look at recognition, reward and retention in what is a hugely challenging environment to work. While the committee welcomed the Minister's commitment guaranteeing sick pay, we are calling for urgent reform to address low pay, poor terms and conditions, and additional measures to make social care a more attractive career in the time ahead. Uh, moving on to staff levels and issues with that, understaffed homes had to manage sickness absence and staff self-isolating as a result of COVID-19. Others were unable to come to work due to caring responsibilities with schools and day centres being closed. Care workers' responsibilities increased with symptom monitoring, increased infection control measures, and providing additional care to large numbers of unwell residents. Caring for dying residents and grieving relatives has undoubtedly taken its toll on their mental health. Access to the Health and Social Care Psychology Helpline was appreciated in this regard. Staff support was also offered by trusts and brought in via agency workers, each solution creating other difficulties of its own and adding pre to pressures in the health service generally as well as increasing risk of infection through staff movements. Efforts must continue to ensure, where possible, agency staff work in one home only. Recognising the workload, the Committee also wants to see staff ratios for care homes agreed in discussion with stakeholders. Turning then to regulation of the sector, stakeholders expressed appreciation for the advice and support role provided by RQAA during the first surge of this pandemic. Others expressed concern at the consequent reduction in inspections at a time when oversight from families and other professionals going into homes was almost non-existent. The committee concluded that both inspections and dedicated advice and support need to be resourced to continue in a pandemic. The RQAA briefed the committee on their move to a risk-based assurance framework and on its research identifying a number of key characteristics associated with homes most at risk of an outbreak. These included larger homes and larger providers, as well as those with recent or frequent management changes. The committee endorses the Minister's desire to ensure that providers can be ins inspected corporately, rather than RQIA being confined to looking to each home individually. The committee also welcomes the Minister's review of regulation and believes there must be consequences for failures of care. We recommend consideration of models by which quality and delivery of care can be linked to funding and reviewed in future contracting arrangements. There should also, we believe, be the capacity to recoup public funds where poor service has been evidenced. In terms of access to health and social care, while we heard impressive reports of innovation and the use of technology to provide safe and effective care during the pandemic, there are clearly limits to approaches such as virtual ward rounds. The committee welcomes the ongoing work being led by the Chief Nursing Officer on an enhanced clinical care framework for care homes. Members were concerned to hear of the adverse impact on residents of reduced access to podiatry, occupational health and other care in terms of their overall well-being. There is a need for a consistent implementation of the policy regarding in-person access to care homes 
as deemed necessary by the health and social care professionals concerned and subject to testing and PPE requirements. Advanced, advanced care planning issues were also raised with the committee. This is a conversation that needs to happen with each care home resident on an individual basis, ideally well ahead of any crisis. It should be led by the clinician who knows the individual best with the input of other relevant professionals and should be reviewed periodically as required. Moving on then, uh, John Corlea, to pandemic planning. A key lesson for the future, we believe, is ensuring care homes are at the very centre of pandemic planning from the outset. There should be centralised procurement and supply of PPE to care homes without charge and ring fence funding that can be accessed quickly via a streamlined and transparent mechanism. We endorse the call in the Rapid Learning Initiative for accredited regional training on infection control. The committee recommends that each home be required to designate an appropriately trained staff member to lead on infection control other than the manager. While the committee recognises the enormous pressure under which HSC and departmental staff were working at all levels and the considerable volume of guidance developed and advice put in place, communication and engagement issues were central to criticisms raised with us. The committee was concerned to hear on several occasions that initiatives had been introduced without prior engagement with providers or unions. Co-design, co-production and robust communication plans remain essential even in a pandemic and could potentially have averted some of the problems raised with us. Having heard impressive evidence of the success of other countries in learning from SARS and containing the current pandemic, we recommend renewed efforts be made to gather and learn from the breadth of international experience of pandemic planning and management. Human rights concerns were raised in respect of visiting, testing and end of life planning. The committee recommends that guidance be developed on consideration of human rights issues during a pandemic. In conclusion, in relation to my remarks as Chair, the Committee wishes to put on record its gratitude to the 691 individuals who took time to respond to our survey, the families who engaged with us virtually, and the stakeholders who appeared before us and have informed our recommendations with their experiences, their concerns and their ideas. I would also like to thank the Clerk and Committee staff on behalf of the Committee who put so much work and effort into the completion of this report. Members will no doubt join me in thanking and acknowledging once again not just our precious care home staff, but the wider health and social care family who continue to struggle to get us through this emergency after what has been now 11 exhausting months. I wish to convey the committee's appreciation to the minister and his senior officials for their positive engagement with the committee throughout this period and acknowledge the number of positive initiatives which were implemented in a short few months. Case numbers and pressures remain worryingly high, but the vaccination programme is already offering protection in our care homes and some hope for the wider community. That said, there is so much work to do and recommendations in this report have potential read across to other sectors in the case of future or indeed future pandemics. The good news is we know what needs doing. Adult social care, reform and wider transformation of the health service have never been more urgent. The mental health toll of the pandemic will require a long-term investment to address these. The recommendations in this report were developed in a collaborative manner, agreed unanimously and are offered in the spirit of constructive engagement as a contribution to future pandemic planning. We look forward to engaging further with the Minister on implementation of the recommendations and trust the Executive will give positive consideration to the financial support required to do so. Kianchoglia, I'd like to make now a few very short remarks in, re in relation to my own role as Sinn Féin Health Spokesperson. Um, I would just like to thank every one of the stakeholders who, who participated in this, um, including independent care home providers, family members, the unions and uh, many, many other groups and organisations who assisted us with this report. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the strong cross-party working during this inquiry by all members. It was clear that identifying the flaws and errors of concern was done constructively and in a bid to offer workable solutions and recommendations. 
I hope the Department and Minister will consider each in that spirit and commit to their recommendation. Just in terms of, of, of a personal reflection, it continues to weigh heavily on us all the impact that this devastating pandemic has had on our, on our people. And I wish to offer again my condolences to everyone who has been uh, a victim of this pandemic in, a, in any way and to those who have sadly lost their lives. This report is into the impact COVID-19 has had on care homes, especially during the first surge. But many of its warnings and lessons would be suitable and would have been suitable for consideration before the COVID pandemic and will remain suitable, I believe, afterwards. Care home residents are not just patients, but of wider families and friends. This has considerable impact on their relationships with visiting and stress about loved ones catching COVID-19. Can call you, I would recommend this report to the Assembly. Thank you, and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and by and large, I would concur with many of the Chair's remarks. Um, I think, as many members have been touched by the COVID-19 pandemic, most notably, we can all look to an experience in which we have watched on at how cruel uh, COVID-19 has sadly affected those that are in care, and for, for many of them, end-of-life care. Mr. Speaker, I myself, and I'm sure other members, I had a close friend in a care home, someone that I would have visited regularly um, in normal times, someone that valued f uh, friendships and valued visitations. Sadly, I had to watch from a window in his closing days as he breathed his last breath, not because he was COVID positive, but because of the restrictions that were put in place. It's been devastating. It really has. And I think that this uh, particular sector will be something we've, we've seen loved ones uh, lose those that are most precious to them and haven't been able to be at their side in what has been their darkest days. So by and large, and I came into the committee late into this process, um, the evidence had already been taken, but I, I, I was, it was something that I think was of value to the committee to, to look into this and see ways in which we could reflect and learn and plan for the way forward. The purpose of the inquiry was to help mitigate and manage the impact of a potential second surge of the virus in care homes. The committee received 21 submissions from a range of organisations spanning public, private and charitable organisations, professional bodies and trade unions. Shortly before the report was agreed, the HSC began to roll out the vaccination programme. Uh, while some of the contact may therefore now be dated, the recommendations are present uh, and a contribution to the future planning. And I think that's one thing that the committee was very aware of, that this is a rolling situation. There's developments continuously. Uh, we welcome the vaccination programme that has been put out at, at high speed into our care homes. That it really is welcome that we can help uh, bring them towards some sense of normality. There's some notable recommendations. I won't have time to touch on them all, but we have recommendations on visiting, testing, PPE, funding reform, uh, standard of care, mental health. You know, these are real issues that I'm sure uh, every one of them in their own right would deserve merit for uh, a debate in this assembly. Uh, but we, we know that this point of this inquiry is a conversation starter. It's something now for us as members in the committee to engage directly with the department and others to see that we can find a credible way forward and prepare for such events. Um, I want to sincerely thank every stakeholder who provided evidence to the inquiry in what were very extremely challenging times. Actually carrying out a committee inquiry like this in, in such circumstances has been difficult, and we must note that, whether that's been through the online forums in which we've had to engage, but also, indeed, dealing with the here and now in relation to COVID-19. We recognise that the rollout of the vaccination programme has dramatically changed the nature of public health response, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't reflect seriously on the deficiencies of, uh, of steps taken in the first wave and use that learning to adopt for more effective measures in future. This report focuses on only one aspect of society that has been impacted by COVID-19. We acknowledge that much more work and investment will be needed to assess the effectiveness of Northern Ireland's response and to look at events in a much more holistic uh, approach in the future. In the meantime, in the immediate future, I, I would have to say, in pointing this out, that we would like to see the Minister take forward the recommendations in enhancing uh, visiting arrangements. This is something that has struck a chord with us all and is still very live and still very relevant. Ramping up asymptomatic testing and expanding mental health support for residents and staff in relation to rapid testing, as has been mentioned by the Chair, this can help prevent staff having to drive significant distances for a test at mass vaccination centres or mass uh, testing centres. 
One of the strengths of this report is that it looks beyond the current crisis we face to the reforms that are needed to transform and revitalise the care home sector in the future. The pandemic has laid bare the weaknesses in relationships between the Department, Trust and Care Homes, whilst also highlighting the great void between staff term conditions and indeed the public and private sectors. We want to see cooperation overhauled in these areas, and the proof will be in the pudding in terms of the Health Minister's stated plans to bring staff terms into line with those in the public sector. We are mindful that Recommendation 29 in relation to staff ratios must be considered in the context of full uh, workforce planning across the health and social care system. There are many questions coming from this report uh, Mr. Speaker, that we will take up in due time with the Minister, but I am glad it is a conversation starter here on what will be a serious issue that we have to deal with and grapple with as we move on from, this, from the first wave and indeed the second of COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Tep or Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I speak today as a member of the Health uh, Committee and as a party spokesperson on health. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those organisations and individuals who contributed to the report before us today and the discussion uh, of the issue on care homes and COVID-19. And I regret that I'll only have five minutes to do it. Um, but I'd like to also thank the Minister for his regular positive engagements uh, and briefings with the Health Committee as a new member. I have definitely found them gratefully helpful uh, and appreciate giving given the serious nature uh, of health at this moment in history that the Minister has kept open and transparent communication with us. This report, report before us today gives a very clear picture of what things have been like for care home residents, staff and families during the course of the pandemic. I do hope that the Minister and the Department will take the findings and recommendations, re recommendations contained within this report and implement them. As outlined in the report, at the start of 2021, 30% of COVID-related deaths had taken place in care homes, 607 deaths, 607 people. This is a shocking figure. The report looked into many different aspects of care homes and the impact of COVID-19. In my remarks here today, there are a few in particular I would like to touch upon. The first is my great and deep admiration for the staff working in such a challenging environment. But I firstly would like to speak on the matter of testing. Whilst it is good to note from the report that the context has changed significantly since the outbreak of the pandemic in terms of testing capacity, increased frequency of testing, regular symptom monitoring and new approaches, I would note that it is deeply, deeply regrettable that at the start of this pandemic, care homes were not equipped to better carry out testing to ensure that the spreading of this virus could be kept to an absolute minimum. Of course, I welcome that the report finds the situation now has much improved. The Committee's recommendations on, the, on that subject to rapid testing becomes available. Care home workers should be tested daily, and testing should also be extended to all those entering uh, nursing homes. It is vital that these crucial steps to track and monitor this virus uh, are taken to ensure every safe measure is taken to protect those in a vulnerable category. Like the committee's finding on testings with regards to PPE and its availability, the situation is improved from what it was at the start of this pandemic. This too is welcome. We all recall the real fear last March with access to PPE, and this must never happen again. On the topic of visiting, next I would like to mention the real severe negative impact that this has had on the families of people with uh, loved ones in care homes. They have had a particularly difficult and upsetting time not being able to visit their loved ones and indeed the residents themselves who have not been able uh, to get that really important time with their family. In line with the committee's recommendations that the care partner scheme be expedited, perhaps in concluding remarks today, the minister could include uh, an update on the scheme in terms of what its uptake to date is and what more he and his department are doing to encourage it. I know personally several families have reached out to me in great distress on this matter. The inability to see their mum or dad safely, the lack of visitation is causing severe distress, uncertainty, and of course, uh, there's an element of suffering. It's very difficult. Um, for lo to not see your loved ones. Especially for those with dementia, lack of visitation has undoubtedly contributed to cognitive decline. As it has been almost a year now, 11 months, since families have seen their parents and loved ones due to the fear of passing on this virus. I recently spoke with Julianne McNally from the Care Home Advice and Support NI Group. Julianne, who lost her mother, pardon me, her grandmother, in the Don Murray Manor home 
and has since fought to get answers about appalling care standards. It was a very thought-provoking discussion. During our meeting, she said, the elderly in our society are not treated equally. If this was children we were talking about, would it be allowed? And I don't think it would. And that's why this report here today on COVID and care homes is so important. It outlines the immediate steps we must implement and recognise the evident failures from last year. So many have been impacted from the separation of their loved ones. And what I fear is one day when we come out the other side of COVID-19, we must recognise that not all loved ones will be here with us. To conclude, Mr Speaker, I very much welcome this report and the opportunity to have spoken on it today. I think we have a responsibility to ensure better preparedness for such an eventuality should it happen again. There are also many lessons to be learnt from this awful experience and many issues which we must urgently address within care homes. Would the member their, remarks to close? Yep, for their residents, staff and for families. And I hope that this report will go at least some way to addressing those issues. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I would hope that uh, this report uh, will be viewed not as a critique of the performance of anyone or anybody during this pandemic in relation to the impact of COVID-19 in care homes, but rather as a learning curve for us all going forward as we continue to try and protect the well-being of everyone, but especially the most vulnerable in our society. It was certainly not the desire of the Health Committee that any aspect of this report should descend into a party political debate around any of the rep recommendations put forward, uh, and I am confident that that will not happen. I am sure that all in this House will welcome the report and support the recommendations. All the recommendations have been put on record in a constructive way, and I'm sure that that is how the Minister and his officials will view them. I think it is important to remind ourselves that we went into this pandemic with all the twists and turns the virus created without any recent experience of dealing with such a situation. And it was not a case of nipping down to the library to borrow a textbook that would spell out how to handle it. The report acknowledges that prior to the arrival of this virus on our shores, we had no sitting assembly for three years and consequently no health minister in post, hardly the best set of circumstances to prepare to fight an enemy like COVID-19. Our NHS was due during those three years of inertia to be reformed by debate around the Bengoa report. That report was sitting for those three years gathering dust and, given the priority demands of actually tackling the pandemic at the moment, continues to gather dust. Our hospital waiting lists in the early part of 2020 were the highest in the United Kingdom. Given all that, we were hardly in the best place to deal with a pandemic situation none of us had any experience of dealing with. The situation in our care homes were that they also were under pressure on a number of points. Many had staff shortages that they struggled to fill. On the plus side, they also had many dedicated people in post who viewed their duties as a vocation rather than just a job. The fact that many of these jobs are paid in accordance with the minimum wage as set by government is hardly an incentive for anyone to choose working in a care home as a long-term career opportunity. Using one home that I am familiar with, it is a home that is of modern design and has an ethos of providing top-class care. That said, it has 40 rooms to be fully serviced, bedding changed and cleaned on a daily basis. It has corridors, specialised bathrooms and common rooms to be cleaned, and four workers share this task during the week. If one is off for any reason, the others have to pick up the extra work carried out during a six-hour shift. At weekends, there are only two staff on duty to complete these tasks. Shortcuts are inevitable, and enormous circumstances are not visible and do not compromise anyone's safety. But during a pandemic, it can be a different story. It is easy to see how a virus can enter a care home and how it can take hold unless every surface has been constantly cleaned. This is labour intensive and needs adequate staffing levels. The issue of staff levels will be paramount going forward. This is a situation that I know the Minister is aware of and have every confidence that any future reform of the care home sector will address this important issue of staff levels, increase pay levels to attract workers to make a career in care, and also ensure that there are proper working conditions in place. The report has 54 recommendations. Many of these have been overtaken by events and either fully or partially already addressed. Many of the recommendations are not possible 
to take up overnight, overnight and will need careful consideration by the Department. They have been made in a constructive manner and I have every confidence that they will be received and studied in that spirit. We owe a huge debt to our frontline hospital staff, but we also must recognise the dedicated work in difficult circumstances being carried out on a daily basis in care and nursing homes. I commend the Department of Health and the Minister for all the assistance, both financial and practical, that they have made available to our care home sector during the past difficult year. All this teamwork and cooperation has undoubtedly helped save lives. However, we must remember all those who fell victim to this dreadful virus and also their grieving families. That, that those families had valuable family time with their loved ones stolen by COVID-19. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise naturally to support this motion into the inquiry report, which the Health Committee staff are to be commended and thanked for all their work on. And I would echo the Chairman's um, thanks to those who gave evidence um, to the inquiry. And I, I would um, agree with him that the session we had informally on the Zoom call with, with the relatives it was probably one of the most moving experiences during this pandemic. I would like to um, put on record that I have a family member who works in a care home. Um, I'd like to start by passing on my sympathies to all those families whose loved ones died in our care homes to this horrendous virus. Your grief will undoubtedly have been made worse by the circumstances of the pandemic. We need to recognise how difficult it has been for residents and their loved ones to have such limited contact, waiting months to even catch a glimpse of their wives, husbands, mothers, fathers. And then when they did, they were aghast at how much they had become withdrawn, sorrowful, their conditions worsened and felt that they were abandoned. This was all alongside the general confusion of the pandemic. Secondly, I, I do not think it suffices just to pay tribute to the care home staff. We need, to, we need to do so much more to show them how much we value them and the support they provide at all times, not just during pandemics, Sorry, but pandemics. They are another group in society who have until now been undervalued and we must never ever forget their contribution. We have therefore seen with huge concern the impact of COVID on our care homes in Northern Ireland and indeed in many other places during the pandemic. Our preparations for a pandemic have not fully been had not fully taken into account the potential of a virus which would spread indoors and which would leave older people particularly exposed to death and serious illness. Therefore, it is evident that the system had not adequately prepared for the impact on care homes. The report rightly outlines that there were already a broader context of an underfunded and unreformed health and social care system and thus of undervalued care homes within that. That made it very difficult to respond adequately when capacities suddenly became limited by greater pressure on the homes with less physical rooms in which to meet that demand because of social distancing requirements. Nevertheless, there were specific issues raised regarding a lack of urgency to get ahead of the virus. Moving on, we saw for a long time an inability to take account sufficiently of the importance of visiting and indeed of meaningful contact to mental well-being. The risk of the virus was increasingly understood, but there was, for many weeks at least, a tendency to focus on the virus without recognising the severe impact of no contact with family and friends. There was, for example, a missed opportunity to introduce care partners at a, an early stage, which should be noted and has been noted here today, that are still not fully implemented across all care homes. And what we have described in this report as innovative methods to allow visiting needed to be put in place long before they were discussed as part of a committee inquiry. Sadly, it is likely that we will pay the price for that lack of contact for years to come. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also um, uh, need to note that I put on record in mid-April a call for testing in care homes regardless of symptoms, as it was an ob obvious means of protecting those who were vulnerable to the virus. So this is not a matter of speaking um, in retrospect. It was obvious early on that testing was one tool which needed to be implemented proactively. We should not have waited until other jurisdictions acted first. Regarding the future, the report contains finding, further findings and recommendations which I hope are find, uh, helpful to the Minister and his department. There are ongoing concerns about the true independence of the RQAA. 
given the resignation of its entire board during the pandemic, and I trust these are now being addressed. We also need to be better prepared for future pandemics, including with regard to equipment storage and helping people cope with bereavement in times of a public emergency. The pandemic has shone a light on the crucial role of this sector and how much, we, how much more we need to do to equip it to play that role and indeed how much we rely on staff, often going beyond the call of duty and acting because this is a vocation to keep it operating at all. The exact nature of an emergency is never easy to predict, but we must apply learning now for future generations. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to recognise the amazing work of Patricia Shepherd and her team at Independent Health and Care Providers. She raised issues affecting care homes with the Department of Health from the start and kept pushing for them to be addressed until the additional funding, the PPE and other support was made available. And I genuinely believe that her tenacity... Without her tenacity, the number of deaths and serious illness would have been a lot worse. Thank you very much. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, whilst I was gathering my thoughts about this debate today or, or this motion today, uh, I mean it's a very sombre topic in terms of talking about those people who have lost their lives, and like others, I want to put my my thoughts and prayers in relation to those families. Um, but it struck a chord actually when Mr. Chambers spoke, and it was disappointing that he actually brought the political point scoring himself into it when he criticised others. I don't think today was a day for political point scoring, talking about the devolution or the, the three years of the suspension of Stormont. However, the other one that struck me today was when I was listening to Carla, and I think she touched it for me in terms of lessons learned. Because if we look at all these recommendations, and I welcome every one of them, and I'm, I'm sure the Minister, and I'm looking forward to the Minister, has to say on that, we could also be critical of if we were too prepared for this, because 18 months ago this would have been unheard of, and if all of this stuff had been sitting, we would have been talking about wastage within the system. So I think there's a balance to be struck between what should be done, what could have been done, and what wasn't done. Uh, so for that point, um, I welcome the recommendations. I mean, all of them make common sense, but I mean, we have to all reflect ourselves, members. 18 months ago, we would never have foreseen something as tragic as this hitting us. I think we were all shocked beyond belief about some of the suggestions that were coming forward. I think we took, the, we took the reliance on care homes as just a matter of fact. They were there. They were there to look after our loved ones. No one predicted what was going to happen. But again, when Johnny was speaking, I was, I was listening to him, and I, I, it strikes a chord because our older population, and I mean, I've lost both my parents, but one thing that was important to them was that they didn't die alone. But here we have in care homes where they were cut off from their families and they couldn't have their families around them at the time of death. I mean, there was a newspaper last week, actually, where in one hospital, I'm not sure where it was, where they brought the husband and wife together and they died six minutes apart. And I think that's, that's testament to the care staff who actually organised that for those family, that family, the husband and wife, to die together. But, but one of the cruel things about the pandemic, this is not a criticism of the minister, this is not a criticism of the homes. We were absolutely caught blindsided by this horrid pandemic. And I think the care homes did step up to the mark. Uh, I, I think the focus primarily at the start obviously was in the hospitals because that's where people the most seriously ill were presenting themselves. But I'm sure each and one, every one of us had care homes contacting us about their concern as this virus continued about the lack of PPE. But again, as I said at the start, I think if we had an abundance of this stuff sitting, there would have been a criticism about overstocks of this stuff sitting. So there was clearly concerns, and I think credit where credit's due, uh, there was a rallying call, but I mean, we have to realise, folks, this wasn't just Northern Ireland. This was a worldwide pandemic. We were bidding for the same stuff as everyone else was bidding for. So I think whilst time, it did take time to get that rollout, um, it, it did get there, and there has been a mini, meaningful change. I suppose the only criticism I do have is that there's still con concern that families still can't get in to see their loved ones. If, you're, if you're, your elderly relative is not upstairs in a care home, you can't get in to talk to them through the window, where others can downstairs. I actually have a member of staff who works for me who has a member of uh, her family is in a trust facility. And I'm not making a reference to the trust, but I just want to, to characterise that. And her sister has been moved upstairs, and that point of contact has been taken away. And I think that's absolutely brutal in terms of that, because I think the families need that interaction both for the patients and the family. The other thing that strikes me about all of this, and I mean, and I want to support the Minister in this one, because whilst we make reference to all these homes, we have to bear in mind lots of these are private homes, privately 
I mean, those, those people who own those are profiting from those. Now, that's not, that's not to say, in terms of these recommendations, we have to put systems in place to make them a better place. But I don't believe that all of the responsibility should be on the Minister to fix those, given that some of these people are actually running uh, private businesses. So, broadly, uh, Mr Speaker, I support this. The other one, I mean, listen to what Paul had said in relation to the rabbit testing. And, and I, like her, asked about the rapid testing early on once we heard that it was rolled out in Liverpool. But bearing in mind that we were working with Westminster government in terms of the rollout of some of this stuff, and actually very dependent on them for this stuff. And, and I remember the minister answering on one occasion about that they, they was, uh, that was a pilot scheme, the one that was done in Liverpool, and they were, waiting, they were going to carry out their own testing this. We have to bear in mind, folks, it's OK for us all to be critical now that we hadn't got that. But imagine we had ruled that out and it wasn't accurate. So I think, to be fair again to the Minister on this occasion, I think he got it right. But what we do want to see is now that, as part of those recommendations, that the testing is carried out. It should be carried out daily. To, I mean, because one of the things that struck us all the is draws, March are how, how can all these people be so sick if they're not allowed out? And it was obvious it was been brought in. So I welcome the report, and I think I welcome all the recommendations in it, and I commend the committee for bringing it forward. And I call Emma Rogan. Firstly, I would like to thank the Health Committee members and the Health Committee clerks and all those that gave evidence and shared their experience um, leading into this um, report. There are quite a few findings and recommendations to go through, but I'll pick out a few um, which I think will add to the debate here today and deserve um, to be mentioned in detail. Um, namely the advanced care planning, the impact on relationships and families and the do not resuscitate orders. We all know coronavirus is highly infectious and it can kill. Tragically, we hear daily the updates of the numbers rising. However, we must not forget each time there is a person, a family and a community wrapped up in grief. In the first surge, nearly half of all deaths occurred within care homes or to care home residents. With the second and third surges seeing that ratio decline, it is clear that care homes and care residents were disproportionately affected. They were truly at the centre of this storm. I want to declare an interest also here. I have family members that work within the care home setting. And most of the staff, almost all of the staff that work within care home settings do it because they love that job. They treat the residents like their own family. They work tirelessly to keep them and uh, try and keep them safe. Members of my family have said the hardest thing when residents, many of them who have dementia, thought they had done something wrong because no one had come to visit and not remembering about COVID, but remembering that no one had came. Speaking to their family members through closed windows and doors is heartbreaking. One of the most difficult things for us as human beings is that close contact with your family, especially the older members of your family. I myself am very fortunate, and I have a granny who's in her, her I should not mind me saying, her, her late 90s, or early 90s, sorry, but she maintains that her family contact keeps her young at heart and keeps her going. But this past year has been very difficult for her and for many of the elderly within our communities. Speaking on the phone to her is just not the same. But it's also worth remembering that most of the older people who receive care, and they receive it in their own homes and in our communities. So the lessons of this report must be considered in many other settings as well. Coming back to the report, I want to highlight and to the issue of advanced care planning. It can have such an important role in the life if it's person-centred and it does everything to make people feel safe. Recommendation 34 states, and I quote, advanced care planning should be discussed with each care home resident on an individual basis, ideally ahead of any crisis. It should be led by the clinical who knows the individual best with input of other relevant professionals and reviewed as necessary. Person-centred care ahead of time, there is no substitute. Recommendations 35 and 36 build on calling on the Department to clearly outline and communicate the rights of older people and families regarding the end-of-life care, ensuring that there is sufficient training for the relevant professionals and making talking about advanced care planning and end-of-life care easy. Unless it's done in a positive way, it can create a sense of doom. In particular, I would like to bring people's minds back to the early stages of the crisis, when the images of hospitals and care homes within Italy and Spain were being overwhelmed. I know there was a lot of concern around older people and care, homes and resident, care home residents being pressured into signing do not resuscitate forms. Let me be very clear. 
no one should, should be pressured into signing a DNR. I also want to briefly touch on a few other things in the recommendations I believe deserve a mention. Ensuring sufficient PPE throughout, through procurement and pandemic planning, regional access to e-learning on infection prevention and control, learning from international best practices and experiences, and addressing staffing levels, and so much more. To finish, I just want to note that most of this report was centred on the pandemic and how best to respond. It highlights the need to ensure a sustainable and high quality car sector. I look forward to the Minister bringing forward his department's proposal for the reform of adult social care, and I welcome and support this report into car homes. I call Sinead Ennis. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I want to start by thanking the Chair of the Health Committee, my colleague uh, Colin Gilvernew, and the members of the Committee for bringing this motion to the Assembly today and giving us the opportunity to debate it. Um, I want to be clear from the start uh, and welcome this report and acknowledge the work that has gone into developing it from all the members of the Health Committee, the Committee staff and the wide number of organisations and individuals who have participated and took part in this inquiry. I would like to echo much of what has uh, been said today from other members. The themes covered on staff levels, access to care, access to PPE, emergency planning preparations, discharge policy and visiting restrictions are all extremely important. I would maybe like to focus my remarks on the issue of funding and the impact this has on the social and emotional needs of care home residents, staff and their wider families. I want to start by acknowledging that the social care sector was struggling before coronavirus arrives on our shores. And as Trevor Clark has mentioned previously, most care homes are privately run, but they are commissioned to provide residential or nursing care beds. I have also heard that many care homes ask for third party contributions as part of the process in securing a bed. And I'd be interested to know if the Minister is aware of this uh, and has looked into how common a practice this is. As apart from a few statutory or trust homes, the vast bulk of care is provided by the private sector. Social care in the North would be virtually non-existent if it wasn't for the private or independent sector. It is important we understand the system in which care homes operated before the pandemic and how it was, to use the Minister's own words, the social care sector has been struggling for years and as a whole is not fit for purpose. I believe the North has few large car home providers, and so the ability to buy or introduce quantities of scale just don't exist. That is why I believe the learning around regional decision making and providing additional funding was so critical for many car homes, their staff, and ultimately the residents. The lack of comprehensive pan pandemic planning to account for car homes in the private sector left them to their own devices. Recommendation 44 clearly offers a solution. The committee recommends that future pandemic planning should factor in the central procurement and supply of PPE to car homes. Surely when we reflect on the impact of the pandemic, it will be a matter of immense shame that many car homes were just left to their own devices, left on their own to secure much needed PPE. I know in South Down we had a phenomenal community response when car homes had to put out a call for PPE, and that is great and that is commendable, but that is not how it should have been. That responsibility should have been with the Department for Health. During the first surge, many car homes couldn't buy PPE and were using their normal weekly stocks in a matter of days. But Mr Speaker, it wasn't only car homes left in limbo. Assisted living sites were also left rudderless too. And the Minister will know that I've constantly raised the case of Camp Hill, Moore and Grange in South Down with him. With assisted living, we're often talking about high functioning people um, who were effectively locked in since last March. They missed huge family milestones, marriages, births, deaths, and they were denied the chance to process the consequences of those important markers in any person's life. And why was that? That is because assisted living was treated like a car home setting when we know that it is, a, it is fundamentally different. It was clear that car homes needed additional funding, and I welcome that, especially as it helped ensure that car homes had no reason not to pay staff more than just the statutory sick pay for those who had to take time off. So I fully back the report's recommendations on funding. In particular, Word argues that there should be a streamlined process for funding, developing a true cost of care for future social care reform, and considering funding to the wider social care sector an essential part of the health care service. To close, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I very much welcome the report and the re recommendations, but the sad reality is that if these recommendations had been in place before, then maybe some of those who lost their lives in our care homes as a result of COVID would still be here today to see their implementation. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you. 
I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate today, and as someone who is not a member of the Health Committee, can I thank the Committee for the work on this very important issue. I believe this report is timely, but also is key to learning for the future. Last Cancola, residents and care homes are our most vulnerable citizens. For a family to place a loved one in, care, in a care home or a residential facility is not an easy decision. But that decision made by families is one based on where a loved one will be safest and best cared for. When you see the dignity and care that is afforded to our loved ones by those who care for them, we see compassion in action. The staff in those homes are trying to juggle their care roles with their family lives at home. During this pandemic, they left their own homes to effectively go and look after their second family. We all know the impact the restrictions have had on our daily lives, but to those in care homes not to be able to have any contact with family and the outside world, it was heartbreaking for residents, for families and for staff alike. In spring and summer of last year, many of us gathered on doorsteps to applaud the workers in the NHS and on the front line. Those who work in care homes are a critical part of our healthcare system. They don't often get the recognition they deserve, and they certainly don't get the financial reward, reward they deserve. To those frontline healthcare workers who staff our care homes in every, in every capacity with compassion and selflessness, we owe you an enormous debt of gratitude. Last count caller, as I said at the outset, residents in those care homes are some of our most vulnerable citizens. And as the wave of coronavirus hit Asia and Europe, our television screens were flooded with stories and images of those in care homes about escalating outbreaks in care home facilities and, unfortunately, bereavements. The natural reaction here was to shut the doors, keep visitors out, and that meant keeping families out. It meant talking to loved ones through windows and not holding their frail hands for months. My own personal experiences of this was talking to a close family friend through the window of a care home and asking him where would he like to have his mother laid to rest. And he didn't get to attend the funeral of his mother. Last count, Cora, this report captures many of the issues we have all heard from our constituents, from restrictions on visiting, staffing levels, PPE, discharging to hospitals and home, to support for staff and families. And like others, I must applaud the steady leadership of Pauline Shepherd, who was a steady hand at the tiller and who was a proactive voice for the care homes at the height of the first wave and since. This pandemic arrived like a bolt out of the blue. It has pushed society and our healthcare systems to the brink. A sad and stark statistic in this report, 40% of deaths here to COVID occurred in care homes. My sincere sympathies with every family who have lost a loved one to this virus. And who could forget the sense of panic almost as staff struggled to get access to appropriate PPE? The community rallied round, thankfully, to make and donate PPE. Care home staff have relayed to us all the stories of heartbreak and pain at the loss of residents who they looked after and who, cared as they, and who they cared for as though they were their own family. And families have contacted us, contacted us all at their wits' end because they have been denied the opportunity to visit a loved one in a care home. And some have told us, told us of their pain, anguish and heartbreak as their mother, father or relative passed away without the company of a loved one. This report highlights very clearly the systemic underinvestment in older persons' care. It shows how unprepared the system was, both public and private, for, such a, for the arrival of such a devastating and trans transmissive Would the member draw his remarks to close? I welcome the publication of this report. I welcome the recommendations therein and support their implementation. Gurra
Captain Corla. I call Liz Kimmins. Uh, firstly, just like everyone else, I, I would welcome this report and thank everyone, particularly the committee, the, my colleague, uh, Chair of the Health <coughs> Committee, Colin Gillerney, and everyone who contributed and helped complete the findings and recommendations. It covers a broad range of areas, and I certainly think this forms the basis for improving a future response, and I hope this House supports the report. The impact of COVID-19 on care homes will be felt long into the future. It will be felt by the families and communities who have lost a loved one. It will be felt by those residents who were unable to see their families and friends in the usual way throughout this time. And it will almost certainly be felt by the thousands of care home staff who were on the front line. And I have serious concerns about the impact of this on their health and well-being in the long term. I would like to declare an interest as a former um, care assistant in a nursing home in my area for many, many years and also working in the social care um, field. And I can safely say, working in a care home is one of the most rewarding jobs I have ever done. Care home staff do not just look after the physical needs of residents, but their emotional and mental well-being. They are a friend, a listening ear, a support for the wider family, and they play a key role in recognising and responding to every resident's needs. And to be able to do all of this in normal cir circumstances, let alone under the pressures of a, a pandemic, is an immense task, but one that is a vocation and something that we all enjoyed. I believe there is an obligation to ensure that social care as a whole, and not just care homes, are better prepared going into the future. This includes better support for unpaid carers, and as well as this, daycare and domiciliary care settings. So I welcome the recommendations that call for a wider look into all of those issues and how care homes play a key role in the delivery of health and social care services. I would like to particularly highlight Recommendation 53, like others, which clearly calls for greater visibility and places human rights at the centre of a pandemic response, including for visiting arrangements and communication with loved ones. This is crucial, and I, like all members of this House, have been contacted by many families throughout this pandemic who were unable to see their loved ones or had to make the excruciating decision of which family member could visit their mum and dad. Supporting personal relationships while keeping care home residents safe is an important balance. However, it is imperative that a regional standard is clearly set out to ensure consistency and fairness of approach and to support care home management in making these really difficult decisions. In concluding, Deputy Speaker, I want to thank all of those staff who went over and above to care and support residents through this really, really challenging time and their families, because without them, uh, we would be in a very, very different place. And I am especially pleased to see the report recommends urgent reform in relation to staff terms and conditions, because one thing this pandemic has shown that it is some of the lowest paid workers in our society who have stepped up to the mark and who have played a vital role for the most vulnerable, and it's past time they got the recognition that they deserve. Gormel, get last can call it. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I also would like to thank the committee for, for bringing this report forward for debate today. And indeed, it, it highlights uh, incredibly difficult and systemic issues that we need to start to address immediately to improve and indeed to save lives. I, like many others in the chamber today, want to put on record my appreciation for those who work in care homes, often in challenging and complex circumstances and in many cases uh, without adequate support or appropriate pay. For many, this is a vacation, and their compassion and hard work needs to be recognised. Deputy Speaker, in 2020, 775 care home residents died with COVID-19, 40% of the deaths in Northern Ireland. Every one of those deaths is an immeasurable loss. For the individuals, their families and care workers, the response was quite simply unacceptable. And we must start the working out of what went wrong and making sure that this cannot happen again. How we got into this situation with such high numbers of deaths in our care homes is complex. The report outlines many different contributing factors, including testing, hospital discharge policies, and structural problems within the sector and in the health and social care. Time is limited, Deputy Speaker, so I will not cover all of the areas of the report, 
but they would like to take some time to go over some of the structural problems highlighted. Deputy Speaker, I fear that our social care system has for far long, far too long, been run on a shoestring. Whilst the Department has, of course, had to channel additional funds into the sector over the course of the pandemic, we really need to take a serious look at ensuring how it is properly funded going forward to provide the high quality of care that should be expected. The lack of investment in the system has undoubtedly been exacerbated, and the issues of staffing levels as well as poor pay and conditions. And they were highlighted by a number of organisations, including the Commissioner for Older People, AGNI, and Marie Curie. Staffing levels have been a challenge for the care home sector for far too long. A situation that's been made more difficult with pressures of the pandemic, sickness, Brexit, staff movement between homes, self-isolation and other systemic issues, for example, such as a lack of childcare. It's clear that much work has to be done in recruiting staff, and while I welcome the measures to speed this up, it's vital that the Department and RQAA monitor this. We also need to be setting out more robust staff to resident ratios. So while ensuring that staff movement between homes is low and practical, we must ensure that we improve the qualifications and training of care home staff. That is vital if we are to turn this into a real opportunity for people to do what they want to do and to work in the care sector. As, been, as has been mentioned, many people who work in our care homes are some of the worst paid. Despite the vital services that they deliver, this has naturally contributes to difficulties in recruitment particularly in retention. So I strongly support the committee's recommendation to set minimum standards for sick pay, to tackle issues with low pay and poor terms and conditions of employment. Better staff remuneration and contractual sick pay to properly reward care home staff will encourage skill retention as well as allow them to be financially secure and be able to self-isolate when ill. Further to this, it is also critical that employers ensure that staff who are at high risk, such as those from uh, the BAME community, are properly protected. I am certainly aware of the wider issues which care home regulation and what I believe are failings in inspection and enforcement, and I have had first-hand experience of this in my own constituency. I do have concerns about the halting of inspections last year. I do appreciate some of the reasons behind it, but I think that we need to be stepping up in care home inspections. Nonetheless, uh, we need to move back towards routine inspection as quickly as possible, with all the necessary mitigations in place and PPP, PPE provided. I strongly agree with the Committee's recommendation for the consequences of the failures of care and how this should be considered in future contracting arrangements, including the capacity to recoup funding where poor service is provided. I have some concerns also around the owners of some care homes. They don't have the appropriate background for providing high quality and caring services. They simply see their homes as an investment. Finally, the report highlights Remember communication the problems in health and social care. We need to learn from our previous complacency. We need to get it right in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the Chair and the Committee and the Committee staff for, for this important uh, report and inquiry. And before I, I comment on the inquiry findings, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to offer my sincere sympathies to all those families who lost a loved one uh, during the pandemic. And it is always difficult, obviously, to lose a loved one. It must have been especially challenging and difficult throughout uh, the last year. I also, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to offer my sympathies and solidarity to all residents, families, and workers. Uh, for the challenges they faced over the last uh, year. Car workers are among the heroes in the fight uh, to keep people safe during the pandemic, and we have to, we must salute their efforts despite the situation they faced. Uh, under the, the report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, the need for this inquiry and its findings are a real indictment of the, the executive's care home policies, and it really demonstrates the inability of the private sector here to put residents, families, and workers before profits. The executive have failed uh, to put a protective ring of steel around our care homes at the onset of this crisis, and this produced tragic consequences for residents and families. We will hear excuse, no doubt, after excuse, but this is a is a fact the, the, that families felt. Um, 
outside of decision-making process, uh, as, as mentioned in the report, and that there was a lack of communication as a result of the chaotic failure of regulation. And the fault for this lies with uh, this House, the Executive. The system of regulation is designed to fail because the private car model exists on the basis of cotton corners. The report highlights staff shortages, low pay, poor conditions for workers, and this was a fact, as others have alluded to. This was a fact before the pandemic. But why has it taken a health pandemic to bring this to attention in such a big way? The executive has tolerated, in fact, promoted a system that treats workers, residents, and families unfairly, where they are uh, denied dignity, respect, and even the semblance of equality. A new decade, new approach, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, commits itself to extending workers' rights, but we see none of that in how workers in this sector are treated. The vast majority of care homes exist within the private sector, and as I have said, the regulations here uh, are weak and chaotic at best. And I believe that this is designed deliberately so that employers can pay workers a pittance and fall short and their obligations to residents and families. And I think it is quite concerning that the former uh, uh, heads of RQIA have joined the body of one care home uh, that has uh, been raised, uh, massive concerns has, has been raised about uh, as well. Uh, how can it be the case, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that the government is giving free um, PPE to private owners? Uh, we obviously want all care homes uh, to have the PPE they need. But why are we spending millions of taxpayers' money when employers, big care homes, have millions, in some cases tens and hundreds of millions, uh, in the bank? The report obviously refers to sick pay and how, and how again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can it be the case that employers in this sector do not provide uh, sick pay for their workers? We are now in a situation where taxpayers are essentially footing the bill for sick pay because some big employers with millions in the bank refuse to do it. It is simply disgraceful and unacceptable. Staff shortages, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the report as well. Uh, health, ser health service workers have been sent into care homes to give assistance. And we all know the extreme uh, pressures on our, in our health service already. We have had to send health service staff into care homes because care home bosses essentially pay a pittance to the workers already in the care homes. And health service workers are working for these employers free of charge. The issue of PPE, Mr Deputy Speaker, is obviously in the report as well. Uh, the executive has handled, handed uh, millions of pounds over to private companies in the form of P PPE, sick pay, training and health uh, service workers. This is called a bailout, and Mr Deputy Speaker, it demonstrates the for-profit model simply does not work. It has not worked, and we have thrown millions into the bank accounts of private care bosses who have stood in the way of workers trying to join a trade union, and who have treated many families who have raised issues with them as a nuisance at best. And some of these employers have the cheek to threaten label against uh, those who have challenged them on their treatment of residents and workers. I want uh, several points, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, to ring out clearly from this report. The Stormont Executive and the for-profit model uh, they tolerate and promote has failed residents, families and workers. All decision-making must directly involve residents and families. All workers have the unobstructed right to trade union representation, and we, we must urgently end the atrocious pay and conditions these workers. And the member draws remarks to close. So in, in conclusion, the private for-profit model should cease. The executive should act urgently to bring care homes back into the health service, where we can then focus on upgrading accountability, regulation, proper funding uh, that is ring-fenced, and paying conditions to the level that is deserved uh, by residents, families and workers. Anything less will be a failure of everybody in that sector. Thank you. Members, the next item of business uh, on the order paper is question time. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until 2 p.m. This debate will then resume after question time when the next speaker will be uh, the Minister for Health. He will be responding to the debate. The sitting is, by leave, suspended. Okay, members, we will resume the, uh, the debate on the committee business, on the uh, Committee for House Inquiry, and to the impact of COVID-19 in care homes. And uh, I call the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, first of all, can I begin by passing on my sympathies um, to all those who have lost um, a loved one during this pandemic? Uh, and can I also fully welcome the publication of the Health Committee's Inquiry uh, report into the impact of COVID-19 in care homes. 
the subject of care homes illustrates more than anything else um, the tightrope that we have to walk, balancing the quality of life with protecting life. And we want to do everything we can to keep those who are most vulnerable safe. And from the beginning of this pandemic, I have been clear that supporting the work of the care home sector has been an absolute priority for the health and social care system. We have done so through guidance, dedicated support teams and the provision of huge quantities of free PPE, additional funding and income support, testing for residents and staff and the deployment of health and social care staff into care homes. There are undoubtedly lessons to be learned and improvements to be made, and I want to thank the committee for producing this report and providing my department and the wider health and social care sector with opportunities to learn and improve. I would also like to reiterate my appreciation to the care home workforce throughout Northern Ireland for the dedication and professionalism they have demonstrated during this pandemic. Care home staff play an essential role in looking after some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And I fully recognise the resilience of staff working across the care sector right from the start of the pandemic and now during these continued challenging times. Key learning from the first surge of the pandemic was the requirement to work together in partnership across the independent and statutory sector to seek solutions to the pandemic response. COVID-19 did not respect any boundaries between these sectors. As I'm sure the committee will appreciate the level of detail contained uh, within the report and the number of recommendations uh, made is actually substantial. And my department will require time to fully consider each finding and how we can best address them. A report of this nature deserves such a considered response. However, today I would like to provide the committee with an assurance that I will be considering each of the areas discussed in the report with a view to taking forward as appropriate relevant measures suggested within the report. The report provides suggested recommendations for improvement uh, in a number of areas. I do not propose to get into detail of each of the recommendations made at this point, but I would like to provide you with some of the key actions either planned or ongoing to assure you of my commitment to supporting the care home sector, its staff and its residents. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the, the detrimental impact that COVID-19 has on residents and their loved ones. Care home residents rightly view care homes as their home, where they maintain connections to families and communities. Probably more than any other area, trying to find the balance between protecting life through reducing the transmission of the virus and ensuring good quality of life has been most difficult. I note the committee states in their report that this is perhaps the most emotive issue they dealt with, and there are no easy answers. I very much sympathise and empathise personally with that position. I also want to note how hard many care home staff have worked to protect residents whilst maintaining their quality of life. We want to continue to do everything we can to keep those who are most vulnerable safe, but we also know that keeping older and more vulnerable people away from contact with their loved ones is hugely detrimental to their physical and mental health, and indeed their human rights. Like the committee, I believe that as a health and social care system, we must continue to facilitate and find creative ways of supporting people to have contact with family and friends. And that includes the use of virtual visiting and other innovative ways to maintain contact. These should supplement the traditional visits and we recommend uh, happening weekly and more in, in the end of life and palliative care circumstances. We are continuing to work with care home, the care home sector and families on the implementation of the Care Partners Initiative. Most other parts of the United Kingdom have now recognised the need uh, for schemes of this kind and have followed our lead. Officials are continuing to look closely at the implementation of visiting and care partners within care homes. We have been clear this is an area that the RQIA will consider when assessing homes. It is also an area where we have made significant additional funding resources available uh, to care homes. £9 million on top of previous funding packages. Whilst recognising that the risk of transmission will be increased with any rise in footfall in care homes, we have sought to put in place a risk-based, sustainable approach to supporting residents and loved ones to have meaningful connections, in particular where isolation is detrimental to residents' physical and mental health. This will be an area on which we will continue to focus, giving careful consideration to the recommendations of the committee. 
Regular testing in our care homes has undoubtedly reduced the impact of COVID-19 uh, during the second wave of this pandemic. The requirement to vary the frequency of testing undertaken is kept under active review and is informed by emerging scientific evidence and other factors as local community transmission rates. My department remains fully commitment, committed to supporting and taking all necessary measures to ensure that care home residents and staff are protected. In that context, officials will continue to carefully consider how new and emerging testing technologies can be implemented and extended more widely across a range of care settings in the future. In January uh, of this year, the Department further extended its COVID-19 testing policy to make a provision for testing to be accessible to designated care partners. Consequently, if a care home advises there is a requirement for a care partner to be tested for COVID-19, this will be undertaken through the regular care home testing programme. We are currently progressing work on a number of new testing interventions, uh, and this includes uh, a care home NTI, which has recently commenced using lateral flow devices to support the visiting policy in care home settings. Mr Speaker, I am also pleased to say that all of Northern Ireland's 483 care homes have been visited by our vaccination teams. And by the close of, close of play on Saturday evening, 410 had received their second visit. Our care homes were the number one priority when it came to the Northern Ireland vaccination programme. In regards to the discharge policy, discharge is an area of policy that we continue to keep under active consideration. We want to both protect care homes from any risk of infection and ensure that residents are not held in hospital with the risks that creates for them any longer than they need be. The Assembly will be aware that it remains the case that individuals discharged from a hospital to a care home should be tested for COVID-19, ideally 48 hours before discharge, and subject to 14 days isolation on arrival. I hope the research published by my department and undertaken by Dr Niall Harity has helped ensure there is an informed debate in this area. The survey undertaken by the committee as part of its work is a further addition to this. Mr Speaker, we took an early decision in March uh, of last year that Trust should make available PPE to care homes without charge. Other nations have now followed this approach, and we continue to provide millions of items of PPE without charge to care homes. Cumulatively, up to the week ending the 22nd of January, 85 million items have been provided to the independent care sector care homes, and that is with an estimated value of approximately £26 million. Funding has also been made available to support care homes where they have contributed or continued to purchase their own PPE. Trust will continue to work with nursing and residential homes on the provision of appropriate PPE without charge where they are unable to source their own supplies. I fully support the Committee's view that training remains critical and all staff should be able to access regular and prompt updates as new knowledge or innovations emerge. My department has made available videos and training through both the Clinical Education Centre and the NISCC, for instance, which focuses on IPC and PPE. In addition, there are programmes from the CEC aimed at those staff who do not regularly look after respiratory patients and or have limited work community-based experience, alongside a number of clinical skills-type programmes to support staff dealing with respiratory patients. CEC programmes related specifically to COVID-19 are open, free of charge, to all sectors. The funding support for care homes was another area where we took early action. We guaranteed a level of income for care homes at an early point to minimise the impact of vacant beds and provide certainty. As far as I am aware, we are the only part of the UK to have guaranteed income in this way. An additional funding has been made available to address the additional costs faced by homes. I announced an initial £6.5 million in April, and that was followed by further packages, including an additional £27.3 million in October. Officials and health and social care staff have continued to work closely with the care home sector representatives on pro- process for claiming funding. As the committee recognises in their recommendation, we do need to balance administrative overheads with the requirements for appropriate audit and verification. And I remain concerned that in some important areas, such as enhanced sick pay, care home providers are choosing not to utilise the funding that is available. 
Our trade union colleagues have raised their deep dissatisfaction on this point, and I share their dismay. Care home providers may wish to explain why some of them are providing enhanced sick pay, while others are not, because, Mr Deputy Speaker, I cannot explain that. I was pleased to see the committee acknowledge the skill and value of the working care homes, the particular personal qualities shared by many of whom it is a vocation rather than a job, and the need to look at recognition, reward and retention in what is a challenging environment. I couldn't agree more. The Assembly will be well aware of my commitment to improving pay and terms and conditions for the social care workforce. I have asked my officials to develop a business case with uh, options for improving low pay for social care workers who are employed by the independent sector providers. This, along with the improvement of training and career pathways, is in line with the key objectives for this reform, as was proposed in the expert panel's report, Power to People. Proposals to reboot adult care and support in Northern Ireland. This was published by my department in 2017. It is clear that this will require a significant recurrent financial commitment, and I will be seeking the support of colleagues across the executive and the approval of funding from the Department of Finance. I also look forward to the support of the members in this House who made similar calls during this debate. Ensuring colleagues in care homes receive the recognition payments I recently announced is another part of ensuring we recognise the contribution that this sector makes. I will, of course, carefully consider the Committee's recommendation that financial support for care homes is linked to improvements in terms and conditions for their workers. Thank you, Minister, for giving way. And, and whilst he said earlier that care homes and staff need protected, and obviously PP is a part of that, does he have any concern that assistance is going to care homes, some of whom have uh, very large profit margins, you know, like Ronwood? Uh, taken £140 million pounds, um, uh, in, in years gone by. Does he have any concern about those kind of care homes? Um, and, and I think what I, I said to the member when, when answering questions earlier on, I would rather have provided that financial support to enable uh, visiting to make sure that the staff had the provision of PPE rather than waiting on some of those companies looking to the reserves um, or their dividends to actually pay for that. So it's something that's an ongoing piece of work. The, the, the many of, the, of those care home providers, and I'll not name any, that do have to look to their own conscience and the board of directors as to where they see the value. Is it simply in the return to their shareholders or the protection of their staff and the residents within, within that sector? Because as well as, as the ongoing measures regarding pay and conditions for our social care staff, I have also asked officials to develop proposals relating to the development of improved career opportunities for the social care workforce. The reform work being undertaken by the Department has now created a new opportunity for social care workers to gain a social work degree and has been successfully implemented in conjunction with the Open University. And I think that goes towards some of the conversation and contribution that Mr Stuart Dixon was making in his contribution. A workforce strategy for social care is also being developed, and I will look at issues including training, CPD and career pathways for the workforce and in addition, a media awareness campaign to promote the value of social care and to support recruitment has been commissioned and will be delivered by the Northern Ireland Social Care Council. Work has commenced under the Chief Nursing Officer's Delivering Care Programme to review st staffing levels across care homes. I fully agree that efforts must continue to be made to minimise staff movement between homes and, that, and would want to note uh, that the Public Health Agency has provided clear guidance for bank and agency staff on this issue. But we must not forget to acknowledge and commend what was working and continued in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, for example through acute care at home teams. However, it became clear we needed to harness that good practice and work towards reducing variance across the region. I expect to see the benefits for residents as a result of the review of the regional acute care at home models and how they provide support to care home residents. I confirm that a programme of work is underway led by the Chief Nursing Officer to address this recommendation, and the enhanced clinical care framework will embed the standards being developed for a regionalised model of acute care at home service. GP participation is inherent throughout the development of the model and will deliver and with delivery of its aims. I acknowledge that there are potential resource costs in regards to, to staff funding, and that will be considered in due course. 
I have noted, Mr Deputy Speaker, the report's contents in relation to advanced care planning, and I appreciate that this is an issue that has been raised um, over the pandemic period. I recognise that ACP is voluntary and empowers a person to talk about what matters to them in their living, in their living and when the time comes that they are dying. ACP decisions will be activated whenever the person cannot be directly involved in decision-making about their treatment and care because of a lack of mental capacity or where they are unable to communicate what their wishes are. Advanced care planning is an important part of palliative care. It has been and continues to be a key priority for the Palliative Care and Partnership Programme. And as the committee is aware, um, I have commissioned the development of an advanced care planning policy for adults in Northern Ireland. In regards to, to regulation, this has been an extremely challenging period for everyone across the health and social care system. All decisions concerning the role of RQIA in the health and social care response to the COVID-19 pandemic have been made with the safety of services at their heart. RQIA continues to provide support and advice to care homes, and I appreciate the Committee's recognition of the difficult decisions in this area. It is important that RQIA focuses activity where it is most needed. I am following an assessment of all the risks. I am confident that RQIA will continue to take a pragmatic and flexible approach to how and when inspections um, are made. The Committee has made an, a number of recommendations in relation to pandemic preparedness. And I will consider all the issues raised very carefully, because my department has established an adult social care governance surge planning group, which is co-chaired by the chief nursing officer um, and the chief social worker. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all care home staff working at every level for their dedication and professionalism, the professionalism that they have demonstrated uh, during this pandemic. I want also to reiterate my thanks to the Health Committee for this report. There is much learning to be done and improvements to be made to allow us to fully support this vital sector. I remain fully committed to supporting this sector, and I believe there is a general acceptance that care homes and the wider social care sector have not been afforded the priority that they merit. I believe that has been the case in different jurisdictions across these islands for years if not decades. This pandemic has shone a harsh light on the importance and vulnerability of the social care sector. We have to start making things better through reform and investment. This is a challenge for us all in this House, as this is an issue that transcends party politics. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee, Ms Pam Cameron, to conclude and wind on the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all the members for their contributions and the Minister for his initial response to the debate. And I certainly look forward to continued engagement with the Minister and Department on taking forward and implementing the many important recommendations, uh, recommendations that the committee's report makes today. We are all too aware of this, the statistics behind this pandemic. It has become daily reading for people across the country looking for a glimmer of hope and willing to see an improvement. However, for far too many families, it, it is not just about a statistic, but a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, a loved one. As the Chair has stated, it is over 775 of our care home residents. I want to thank the many individuals and families that engaged with the committee during the process of this inquiry. It is important that the voices of residents and their families are heard and that they stay central to how the Minister responds over coming weeks and months. On behalf of the committee, I want to pay tribute to those staff working in care homes over this last year in extremely difficult circumstances, putting themselves at risk to ensure that our loved ones are looked after. We have seen the difficulties, stress and strains, and you have worked through that as staff, and we thank you for that. We hope that these recommendations will make improvements to processes and procedures to support you in your important role in those care settings and allow a better approach to future pandemic planning. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I will now mention some of the contributions made by members during the debate of this report. Jonathan Buckley outlined that the report is a conversation starter with the Minister and outlined the difficulties that families and residents are facing when visiting. He also welcomed the rollout of the vaccination programme in care homes, which is something we all welcome. Cara Hunter said that the report paints a picture of the experiences of residents, families and staff during this pandemic and talked about how it was regrettable that, in, that the testing regime was not in place early on in care homes, but welcomed the improvements over recent months. Alan Chambers talked about staff shortages facing care homes during the pandemic and the need for adequate staffing levels and improvements in pay levels in care homes. Paula Bradshaw outlined the real impact that the pandemic had had on the health and well-being of residents and the need for regular quality contact between residents and families to improve the health and well-being of residents and their families. Trevor Clark stated that too many people died without their family around them in this pandemic and outlined the importance of learning lessons from this pandemic and putting in place plans based on those lessons learned. Emma Rogan highlighted the importance of regular contact with the older generation and the importance of contact in keeping families connected. Sinead Ennis stated that the sector was struggling before the pandemic and that there is a requirement for a review of adult social care and appropriate funding levels to deliver care. She had also outlined the problems in procuring PPE. Justin McNulty, along with all members, commended the great work of staff in care homes and how care staff see residents as their second family and we are all thankful for the emotional support that carers give to residents. He also rightly said that the pandemic pushed the system to the brink. Liz Kimmon stated that the report forms the basis of a response to future health crisis and that there was a need to put human rights at the centre of this and any future response. Stuart Dixon said that we need to ensure that the scale of deaths and what we have seen in care homes should not happen again and that there is a need for care homes to be properly resourced and this will mean additional investment in the sector. Jerry Carroll outlined that one of the issues that caused delay in response was regulation and that the pandemic has brought this issue to the fore. He also outlined <coughs> excuse me, the staffing shortages in care homes and that there was a need to involve families in decision making. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, just turning to some of the Minister's comments, um, rather than recite the, his whole speech, I'll just name uh, some of the mentions that he made. And he rightly talked about the tightrope, um, about balancing the quality of life and um, keeping the vulnerable safe, and I think that's really important to keep that uppermost in our, in our heads. Um, he talked about the guidance and the staff support and the huge quantities of PPE and support that we're giving to the care homes. Um, he talked about the fully, uh, the fully recognised the resilience of staff members in the sector and he said that it, it, it would take time to consider his response to the report. Um, key actions uh, were planned and ongoing. He talked about the hugely detrimental um, issue around keeping residents away from others and the impact that, that has had on their overall health. He uh, said they were looking closely at visitation and uh, he also talked about testing and uh, said that they were fully committed to taking on the measures to support the staff and residents in, in regards to continuing that testing process. He also touched upon the care partner issue and said that uh, testing will be taken um, under the care home setting if that was requested. Uh, I think it's important to remember that um, the Minister did mention that all of the 483 care homes have seen the vaccinators and that's very welcome news I think for us all and also to hear that 410 have had their second visit of vaccination that's also very welcome news. Uh, the, test, the testing um, on discharge to home um, from hospital settings that is to be done 48 hours prior, um, is well documented and he touched again on the PPE and the, the fact that they are continuing to provide millions of items free of charge to these healthcare settings and that is also important. He um, also talked about the funding also to be provided to minimise the impact of vacant beds. He agreed that training was critical 
and he also touched upon the train unions and shared concern around the provision of sick pay. He also talked about seeking support from the executive in the giving of uh, additional financial support. So um, he also referred to the workforce strategy for social care and said that was also being looked at and talked about the advanced care planning importance and how decisions would uh, be um, acted upon at the appropriate time and referred to that advanced care planning development. He also touched upon the RQI's role in inspection and support of the care home settings. <clears throat> and he thanked uh, the Health Committee for its particular support throughout this. So, uh, Deb, I just want to turn to a few comments um, from myself as, as an M a DUP MLA. Um, before I start those remarks, I want to thank the committee staff in particular for the vast amount of work that they have put into supporting the committee at this time, in particular through this inquiry and indeed um, all the additional um, health committee meetings that we have had in recent days. And I'd once again like to express my deepest sympathies to those who have lost loved ones and friends in care homes throughout this pandemic. And I'm conscious that too, there will be many living in care homes today who will be missing friends and will have borne an incredible emotional burden for this last year. And that should not be underestimated. The anxiety and worry of contracting the virus, coupled with a sense of loneliness and separation from loved ones, is hard for us to comprehend and to fully appreciate. Furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to the staff in our care homes. The physical and emotional strain that staff have faced has been unprecedented. Infection control, cleanliness, meeting the physical and emotional needs of residents and dealing with their own grief will not have been easy. Society owe a great debt of gratitude to every one of those dedicated members of staff. As a party, we welcome the publication of this report. With 54 detailed recommendations, it comes after extensive and very meaningful engagement, and we thank all those stakeholders who provided evidence to the inquiry in what remain very challenging times. While the rollout of the vaccine will dramatically change the nature of the public health response, this doesn't mean that we should um, reflect seriously on the deficiencies of steps taken in the first wave and use that learning to adopt more effective measures in any future crisis scenario. I will focus my remarks on a small number of the recommendations, indeed starting with recommendation one, the safe and meaningful visit visitation should be facilitated and resourced through the identification, development and implementation of innovative measures. And it's fair to say that there's been a deep sense of frustration among families at what at times have, has appeared to be a lack of prioritisation given to accommodating visits to loved ones. I've spoken with families who have watched loved ones become emotionally detached throughout this period, indeed particularly for those living with conditions like dementia. That lack of understanding as to why visitation has ceased or become so distant has caused untold damage to their overall health. Those close contact visits are vital to so many residents. This report highlights the need for a more innovative approach to finding solutions to the loss of contact, and this is something we strongly support. It also prioritises the need for the input of residents and families into visiting arrangements to establish a more consistent and streamlined approach between care homes, regardless of whether they are independently or publicly owned. Mr Deputy Speaker, the mental health impact on residents of reduced visiting has not yet been quantified and it is important that we do not neglect the significant work that will be needed to meet the demand for services in the medium to long term. I trust the Minister will take forward this recommendation indeed by implementing Recommendation 2 and discussing this with those most affected. Mr Deputy Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the case for reform of social care and it is vital that the needs of care homes at the heart of a longer term vision to improve standard of care and reward those working in the sector. One of the strengths of this report is that it looks beyond the current crisis we face to the reforms that are needed to transform and vitalise the care home sector in the future. The pandemic has laid bare the weaknesses in relationships between the Department Trust and care homes, whilst also highlighting the great void between staff terms and conditions in the public and private sectors. We want to see cooperation over overhauled in these areas. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, and we will be looking forward to seeing the outcome in terms of the Health Minister's stated plans 
to bring staff terms into line with those of the public sector. We strongly support the recommendation to see an enhanced framework based on the principles of acute care at home introduced in care homes. It would be wrong and inconceivable that residents in care homes have poor access to a range of health services than someone living in their own home. This includes contact, of course, with their regular GP, and we need to ensure that the standard is of, of care is high and remains high and is also equitable across the board for future crises. Mr Deputy Speaker, obviously this inquiry gives much more direction to the Minister in terms of the course of action required, and I would be keen to know from the Minister how the implementation of these recommendations will be monitored. There is much to learn, and I hope the Department does learn and adapt its policies accordingly, whether that be in relation to visiting, the budget flexibility, to GP access, or many of the other areas highlighted within this report. In the immediate future, we would like to see the Minister take forward the recommendations on enhancing visiting arrangements, ramping up asymptomatic testing and expanding mental health support for residents and staff. So I'm going to end there. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I commend this report to the House. Thank you, members. The question now is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the, the motion is approved. Thank you. If you just take your ease now while we move to the next item of business.